name is Tiffany Jenkins, and I'm going to be chair of this discussion called The Empty Square, The Public Engaged or Imagined. So to speak to you this afternoon first will be Deborah Matteson. Deborah's on my far right. She's a leading political pollster. She's the author of Talking to a Brick Wall, and she's the director of Britain Thinks Consultancy. <coughs> After Deborah, we'll hear from Joyce Macmillan, who's on my immediate left. Joyce is a theatre critic of The Scotsman. She writes a political and social commentary column for the paper as well. She's chair of the Hansard Society Working Group in Scotland. And she is a commission member of the Carnegie Inquiry into the Future of Civil Society, which looked at both Ireland and the UK. After Joyce, on my immediate right, is Graeme Stewart. Graeme is the Conservative Member of Parliament for the Beverly, the Beverly and Holderness. He's the chairman of the Education Select Committee and East Riding Health Action Group. And then we'll hear from Frank Faraday on my far left. Frank is professor of sociology at the University of Kent, Canterbury. He's the author of Wasted, Politics of Fear, and Where Have All the Intellectuals Gone? So is the public engaged? At first sight, you might think, well, actually, a little bit more than it was is perhaps the answer to that. So in the last election, we saw turnout up. In fact, turnout was up in the election before that as well, from a low in 2001. Um, at the beginning of the 2010 election campaign, people were predicting that the public were quite simply going to fall asleep. In fact, I think I predicted that myself. But actually, what we saw was a slightly more energized campaign. Um, the debates, the TV debates, I think, providing a, a format and, and a spark that election campaigns hadn't had um, for the, for the previous, in previous years. After the election, we ended up with something a bit novel and different. So we all sat up and took notice. We had a coalition government. We had two political parties working together um, for the national good, or so, so, they, so they say. Um, and actually, for a lot of voters, for a lot of the public who are somewhat turned off party politics, that represents something of an ideal. It's a great thought to have two political parties working together. And then, you know, another positive ingredient in the mix is that those two parties are working together. We're facing a huge issue, a huge problem, and they're working on issues that affect all of us. Sometimes the public struggles to see how politics can change their lives. They're not struggling at the moment. It's pretty obvious how politics can affect their lives. And as the government would tell us, we're all in this together. So, so the short answer ought to be yes, really. And I could perhaps just sit down then, and that would be that. And yet, it actually isn't that straightforward. Um, in my book, Talking to a Brick Wall, what I talk about is, um, is, is 25 years of doing political polling. Um, and I think what I've observed more often uh, than anything else in that 25 years, and uh, forgive me, I'm, I've got a politician on my left, and I'm about to be very rude about politicians, but there is this sense that politicians and voters, <laughs> frankly, are operating in parallel universes with very little mutual understanding and quite a lot of mutual contempt. Um, one of the exercises that I often get people to do in focus groups is to sort of jot down, um, a, 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 I call it a written trigger session, the words that you would use to describe a politician, the sort of generic politician, if you were describing it to somebody who'd landed from Mars and didn't know what they were. And what I've noted over the years is the increasingly kind of sneering cynicism in the voters' profiles. I'll read you a few that came from a little exercise that I did during the election campaign. So what kind of person is a politician? I asked them what kind of car the politician would drive. Well, the politician would drive an environmentally friendly car chosen for its image. What does the politician do in their free time? They do charity work and talk about it a lot. What else do they do in their free time? They become a football supporter in the run-up to the election to show that they're a, a man of the people. Um, and then here are some of the things that they, some of the adjectives that they use to describe, words that they use to describe politicians. Out for number one, two-faced, shady, I'm sorry about this, um, <laughs> out of touch, on the make. So, you know, th there, is a, there is a big gulf between where politicians are and where, where, where people are and how people see them. So, and in the book, what I'm, what I'm doing is describing the kind of ups and downs of new labor seen through the voters' eyes, but also telling the story of the voters' disengagement um, and how that's grown. And I, I just wanted to point up, flag up a few things that we might then come back to and discuss. 
uh, five things that I think are the problems uh, with the gap between the political world and the public. The first is that politicians are meant to be representative, but too often they're not. They are simply not representative of the public that they purport to represent. Um, you know, we have a prime minister who went to Eton. Um, all five of the Labour candidates um, had gone from Oxbridge straight into politics with almost nothing in between. Um, and, you know, if you look at what, what, what the public is like in terms of, you know, gender, age, race, and so on, it's quite hard to see how that lot are, are, are representative. Secondly, politicians don't listen. This was really the talking to a brick wall story. It's why I called the book Talking to a Brick Wall. Um, the, the, the feeling that voters had was that politicians only listened to them when they wanted to get elected. Thirdly, people don't actually know what politicians do. Um, the, the expenses debate uh, was ostensibly all about money and how much MPs were paid and what expenses they got. But in fact, I think it was really about the job that they do because people don't know what that is. And when you buy something, you're looking at the total value of it. You're looking at what you get from it. You're not just getting at what, looking at what you've paid. So people don't know what politicians do, and too often they don't know how it affects them. The net result, and the kind of, in a sense, the, the, the big idea that I'd like to leave my opening remarks, leave you with, is that what I think we then end up with is what I call Peter Pan politics. Um, where politics is something that is done to people by politicians, uh, they are the kind of re passive recipients. It's not a game that they're involved with or that they play, um, other than as kind of consumers of services, of consumers of things that are doled out. And what that then means is that you live in this sort of, it perpetuates this sense of unreality. So in the 2010 election is a great example of that. Everybody knew the cuts were coming. Nobody, including the voters, actually wanted to talk about it. So, um, I, th I think just a, a final thought to leave you with is um, during the election campaign, I set up a panel of swing voters in one of the most marginal constituencies, Harlow. And after the election, I asked them uh, you know, to come up with a kind of wish list for how to change politics uh, going forward and how to kind of, if you like, mend the gulf between politicians and the public. Now, they came up with a, a, a wish list. A lot of the things on the wish list were to do with what politicians do and what they were paid. But an awful lot more of them were to do with voters themselves and how we can empower people and educate people and then create the real kind of interaction that would, would bridge the gulf between voter and politician. Um, well, I, th I think actually in, in many ways I'm, I'm agreeing with a lot of what, um, of what Deborah um, <coughs> has been saying. Um, thinking about the idea of the empty square, I had two initial responses. The first is that, as Tiffany says, I've spent the last four years uh, being a member, uh, you know, in a, in a very little of my own sort of spare time, it's a voluntary thing, of uh, a commission member of the Carnegie Inquiry into the future of civil society in Britain and Ireland. And I think that has just confirmed my feeling that people in Britain, certainly, and, and probably in Ireland too, are not nearly as disengaged as the political class um, likes to think they are. In fact, they're very engaged with the problems and issues of their society, and a surprisingly large number of them actually do something voluntarily about it without any, um, any obvious benefit um, to themselves at all. But what they do feel is disempowered. They feel that no matter how hard they work in their communities, uh, no matter how many opinions they express around the pub, no matter how much they discuss things with their children or any other um, people in their lives, somehow the voices that they have and the ideas that they develop um, have got a very low chance of really making their way uh, into the top table um, of policy making. So I think that is the issue that we face. It's not so much disengagement. It's a kind of um, depression consequent on, on um, disempowerment. And I think that's really the issue that our societies have to address. The other thing that really struck me about this session when I was reading the, the blurb for it in the program um, was the very true observation in it that this tends to be a very top-down debate. What you really hear, and it's really quite comical when you think of it, is a not very appealing political class sitting around wondering why nobody's interested in them and what they do and, and doesn't rush out in huge numbers to vote in every election that they hold and all the rest of it. Um, and so it tends to be framed very much as, well, here we are sitting here doing all this valuable political work. Why are people not engaged with it? And then they send out people to, to do surveys or write reports um, about this 
perceived disengagement, but often the people who are perceiving the disengagement are in fact the politicians who are causing um, the problems in the first place. So I try to look at it from the other angle and think, well, what is it actually that motivates people to really become engaged in the political as opposed to just the community or voluntary or, or general life of their community? Um, and I think basically, strangely, like a sort of advertising person, I came up with three I's, which slightly puzzled me. I have no intention of doing that, and I is not my favourite letter of the alphabet, but there it was. Um, I think the first thing that really motivates people to become engaged with politics is injustice. Um, and I think this poses a problem to affluent societies in their most affluent phases. If you look at our great sort of political narratives, they tend all to be about injustice, and particularly economic injustice, although other kinds of injustice as well, racial um, and all the rest of it. So if people perceive a problem in their society, which they think is no longer tolerable, then they tend to begin to try to think of ways of engaging with politics. So that doesn't mean that it's a good thing to have injustice because it makes people engage with politics, but it does mean that we have to take into account the fact that at moments when our society is going relatively well, and particularly when it's a phase of economic growth and relative private affluence, then it would be normal actually for people just to get on with their own private lives and to engage with politics a little less. And as Deborah has observed, it would be normal for people to become a bit more engaged again in a time of economic crisis when they feel that their positions um, are under threat and all the rest of it. The second thing, and this is something I'm particularly interested in from a Scottish angle, is identity. Because people cannot engage with the political community if they don't think they belong to any communities. So whatever level it's at, whether it's at the level of London or Edinburgh or Scotland or the UK or the European Union or the whole global community trying to operate um, through the UN, people have to have in their minds a sense of those communities and that those communities are quite powerful and they matter. Being a Scot, you have quite a kind of natural sort of uh, inborn expertise in negotiating between the different levels of political community that you belong to because you have to all the time and I'm a veteran of the campaign for a Scottish Parliament and could talk for hours about the different ways in which, which the Scottish identity worked and operated um, politically in that situation and during um, that campaign. The British identity is actually still a very strong political identity. People in the UK by and large expect the UK government to do something about things if things go wrong. It's the strongest um, identity that we have. But I think those who are not in the habit of thinking, if you like, about the cultural um, and emotional dimensions of identity really need to take on board that if people don't have a community with which they identify, then they can't do politics. And we have to think very hard and adaptively all the time about how those communities are changing and where they are. And my third eye is institutions, which Deborah has already um, touched on. Really, for people to be able to become productively engaged in politics, we need institutions that are up to the task. And I think that's where the immediate, as opposed to this kind of more medium term, term crisis in British political engagement is that some of our institutions are okay but a lot of them are looking particularly rusty and unequal to the task of representing um, the situation that we're in. Deborah's already talked about the actually personally unrepresentative character of the very narrow political class that we now um, seem to have grown and it seems to me certainly from my experience trying to develop good new institutions for the Scottish Parliament, which has been partly successful, partly not, um, that you need institutions which are pretty strong. So the idea of rolling back and weakening the state actually militates against political engagement in quite a deliberate way. I mean, you're not surprised that Rupert Murdoch is happy if everybody thinks politicians aren't worth talking to, because of course that just uh, widens the field for the market to, to do what it likes. So you, know, you, need politicians, uh, you need political institutions which are quite strong, which are quite independent, which are not constantly compromised by slightly dodgy um, relationships with various forms of privatised provision and sort of interactions between civil servants and, and, and industry in that sense. So they, they need to have a certain kind of feeling of integrity and independence about them. You need them to be relevant in their shape, and that's where our political parties are coming unstuck. They no longer represent such really big, significant differences of opinion that people can strongly identify them and see them as serious social movements rather than mere kind of, kind of career parties for politicians um, and they need to be really adaptive they need to be fast on their feet in, in detecting how people's ways of interacting are changing in keeping up with technological change um, and in and in reinventing themselves um, for the times 
um, that they live in. I think our political parties in particular as institutions and our parliamentary assemblies as a consequence of that are doing a pretty bad job of that uh, uh, now. I think they've become dangerously unopened to, to people outside that sort of very narrow uh, political career track that Deborah described. And the final big thing is that, is that you have to think about mediation because in any political community, even if it's just a little town with a town crier, whoever mediates the idea of that political community and of what it can do to the people holds a tremendous amount of power. So the power of the media is a constant present um, in, in, in the mediation of, of people's sense of what they can do in politics. And it's something that we have to be aware of all the time, but it's not just the big media. It's also how people have ideas about politics mediated to them through their families and through their own communities. I think a lot of those processes of personal mediation through things like churches and trade unions have been weakened in our society and we need to think about how we constructively replace them so that even in their personal lives people have a sense mediated to them of what um, political communities they belong to and how they can be productively active in them. Thank you. Well, I am, of course, the politician, so uh, I'm following De Deborah's list of how the public views politicians. Um, uh, having said that, I'm, I'm also, uh, as well as being a politician, I'm an optimist. I don't suppose I'd be involved in politics if I wasn't optimistic, and optimistic about public engagement with politics. It, where um, politics and the people have got a gap, it doesn't have to be that way, and perhaps it's partly a function of the numbers, but... In my particular seat, I inherited a majority, I think, of 700 odd. It was a conservative seat already, and then built that up through 2005 to now to just short of 13,000, and spend most Saturday mornings standing on a street corner uh, in the street trying to break down the barriers which people do feel there, there are between them and the people who represent them. And just by, uh, as much as the people you speak to when you stand there on a cold November morning in a drizzle, um, uh, appreciating the opportunity to speak to someone who can, on the Monday, go and speak to secretaries of state and carry their views to them, is the fact that you are making it clear that you are available for people to talk to. And I think that is uh, important and valuable and can be done. And I think um, Deborah uh, said she feels that the, the public is less engaged. I think the public is more engaged um, than previously. Uh, there's always a golden past when they feel that things were better. But actually, I think things are, from an engagement point of view, pretty good today, but can be a lot better. And, and from the combination, all the old mediums, so public meetings, which are so unfashionable. I was chairing a public meeting last night, a packed village hall, because there was an issue that people cared about. They came from two villages there. I chaired it. We all I tried to be as neutral as I could while we ganged up on Yorkshire water to make them do what they should have done in the first place without needing to be dragged there for humiliation. But it worked, I felt, and uh, I feel they'll go away and fix it. Um, uh, the street surgeries, as I say, um, parliamentary visits. Uh, I've had, you know, getting towards 1,000 people come down from East Yorkshire, of all places, to the Houses of Parliament and stand in the middle of Central Lobby which I always tell them is my favourite point. If you ever go into the central lobby of the House of Commons, you look one direction and you can see the seat on which the Speaker sits in the House of Commons. You look the other way and you see the golden throne on which the Queen um, uh, gives the Queen's speech. And I think it's, it was brilliantly designed 170 years ago um, to allow constituents to come to this very epicentre of British political power and life and remind people like me who sent who where and to remind people like me, who easily get confused in the House of Commons as to who is the master and who is the servant. Um, the, there are so many ways that we do tend to engage, be it Facebook, um, uh, Twitter, the rest of it, the websites. Um, there are so many different approaches, and, and, and I think today's politicians are exposed to those. You've got to try and balance it out. In, in some ways, um, today's politicians, in order to uh, to win elections are uh, almost too exposed to those things. Um, it doesn't stop some people having their feet moved from the ground, but there also needs to be time for reflection and thought in its own right. And I sometimes feel that you could have a, a sign on politicians' car saying, no job too small, um, because they'd like to be round and about showing that they're in every area all the time. Because I know my constituents tend to think most favorably of me when they see me in the constituency, when they see me on that cold November morning in Withensea, um, in the coastal town, being there. And I think it's absolutely right that they should appreciate that, but you've got to find a balance so that you've got time to think, read, reflect, and 
uh, take part in decisions which, unless you are involved in it on an everyday basis, you're not going to be able to too easily come to a judgment in, um, in Withensee. Um, where we have a lot of barriers, I'm, I'm the chairman of the Education Select Committee, and I, the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, well, not in this country it doesn't because we've got Ofsted come in and accuse schools of not having high enough fences to block people out. Anyone who comes in has to go through an electronic pass system to get in. They have to sign in, and if they're going to spend any time with a child, they need a CRB check. We have, a, 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 we have institutionalized distrust um, to the extent that instead of being able to support and talk to um, mentor a neighbor's um, child, you're in fact scared even to engage them in conversation in the street for fear of being uh, stigmatized. Um, and I think uh, one of the ways we need to engage is we need to engage in the society we're in, forget politics. If we're not able to talk to the, the boy who always looks sad four doors down, then we're not much of a society and we need to try and break that down. Um, a final point, I'd say the financial crisis is obviously the overwhelming issue of the day and that's, I think the, the public recognise, it's always dangerous to talk about the public in a generalised sense, but the public recognise that actually uh, they they, they know that their own understanding of the issues, as is true for many politicians like myself, is weak. So that's why they end up, they recognize they're being unreasonable when they both say that the, the deficit must be tackled and at the same time refuse to engage in addressing those cuts. And when those guts, cuts come along, uh, almost always find them to be unacceptable or driven by um, uh, negative motives. Then people are very quick to think that other people are unfair, that somebody's terribly privileged and gets up in the morning looking to visit evil on um, the people below them. And it's unlikely to be a descriptor of anyone we actually know, and yet we're very happy to do it, to generalize about um, politicians as a group. Um, so I think we have to accept, as I say, that uh, in areas such as uh, the economy, that the public want politicians to get on with it. They don't want to thank us for getting on with it, but they want us to get on with it, and they want us to come to the right decisions. And right now, people, I think, of all parties and none, have a crossed finger behind their back, hoping that George Osborne is making the right calls on the economy, so that in the long term, we have a better and more prosperous society for everyone, rich and poor alike. I think that the discussion on public engagement suffers from the fact that it's done from the perspective of a a political elite that is itself socially isolated and therefore has a perception of a public as this object that you uh, sort of engage with. And that, that in itself tells me straight away that almost invariably when we use the word public, we're not talking about the public in the way that it's been historically understood. You know, I don't know if you remember when you see pictures of some politicians, sometimes their advisors tell them, have more people around you, it looks better that way. You're not isolated. And I think that self-consciousness of having to have 20 people, you know, sort of, of different colors and sizes, you know, near you, uh, that kind of self-conscious attempt to be part of something, it, it, it's something that occurs at all levels of political life. And I think the real problem in many ways is not the politicians, because they're just, you know, regular guys, you know, like Stuart and others, you know, sort of. I think it's the bad advice they're getting on a number of different points, and it's all the experts and the media around them. So the way that I see it is that, um, in, in many respects, the public has become a project that you have projects of inclusion. You know, New Labour loved having these projects of inclusion. And I remember you would have every museum saying, you know, well, we're showing fine art, but we're also spending millions of pounds on including the people in this. And of course, anybody with a, you know, who's any sense, any sense knows that the minute the public becomes a project that you artificially include, it acquires this fantasy-like character. And I think that almost everything that we say about public engagement, not, you know, counting the numbers, desperately asking, is, has the voting gone up by 2% compared to last time, all represent this kind of fantasy of, of trying to create a link that really isn't there. I mean, just because you vote on a particular time, just because you come to a meeting, does not, in a sense, involve or imply the reality of, of, of a public. And I think that needs to be uh, sort of understood because historically, a public means uh, a group of people that got a sense of themselves as being something distinct, independent, that senses or intuits it's got some power and its influence, that it's got something that has in common. So therefore, the idea of empowering the public is a contradiction in terms. You don't empower. That's, that's enfeebling people when you give them power. 
uh, and that needs to be you know, sort of uh, kind of un understood you know, sort of fairly clearly. Now, what is the problem? Because I don't think there is, a, you know, I, I think most of us in this room are mature enough to know that almost every form of public engagement is a kind of impression management. I mean, that's really what it does. And it's got no, you know, people make a lot of money out of it, but it really doesn't bear upon uh, everyday life. I think the problem is a cultural one. And I think that's the domain where that we should be addressing. And the culture problem that we have is something that Machiavelli, for example, identified a very long time ago, uh, along with uh, all the Renaissance humanists, basically understood that the strength of a body politics is determined by the amount of public spirit developed within it. Public spirit, right? That's really what we're talking about, real public spirit. And that, as far as Machiavelli was concerned, accounted for the strength of the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic, specifically, and also you know, for the incredible things that were going on in Florence, Siena, and other kind of places. And Machiavelli, and, uh, along with the other humanists, made a point that public spirit presupposes a set of virtues, you know, uh, forms of behavior that you expect people to have, uh, that part and parcel of life. And these kind of virtues would be devotion. I mean, many of them are really old-fashioned. They, they just sound horrible, you know, which is, a, again, a, a symptom of our problems. Devotion, courage, patriotic commitment, risk-taking, and all the rest of that. Now, my argument is very simple, which is basically, I would argue that almost every single virtue that makes for public spirit is stigmatized by our kind of society. It, it's highly stigmatized and is seen as being ever all, you know, sort of something that we get, kind of get rid of altogether. I mean, if you were listening to the discussion going on in London just recently about, about the bombings, you know, the, the recollection of people about what happened on that terrible day, you know, the thing that really struck me is that time and time again you had stories of people, the public, I don't want to call them, wanting to do things for the people that were being hurt but then being told by the fire officer that for health and safety reasons, we cannot go near anywhere these people, right? That's a no-go area. Just imagine. You know, so here are all these people, they're trying to help others and do the right thing, but there is a very clear process that you've got to go through. And if and you think of all the processes that we've implemented, all the procedures, uh, they are, are designed to, in a sense, displace public interaction, the, the public being virtuous, by relying on different kinds of codes of conduct and, and, and all the rest of that. And we, and we do that in all kinds of ways. I mean, I mean, this morning I heard, I almost felt like throwing up, because I've heard it so many times, yet another plea for volunteering. Now call me old-fashioned, but when I was young, you volunteered, you know, because you wanted to, you believed in something. You know, I want to help those guys out, you know, I want to give a bit of blood, you know, so I want to do this. You didn't do volunteering because it looked good on your CV, or it, it wasn't something you kind of deposited in a bank for the future in the way that is being suggested. So volunteering, which you know, has a virtuous potential, has been turned into a process that you kind of do in pretty much in the way that you clock on to a job. Uh, I just want to give you one example because I haven't got time to go into all the virtues that have been stigmatized. One of the things I care about is devotion and care, which I think you know, you know, is, is really actually quite important, the way we relate to each other as other human beings. And I noticed that when I was writing a book called Therapeutic Culture a few years ago, I have noticed that devotion and care has become increasingly stigmatized and often uh, sort of uh, kind of expressed and, and, and defined as a marker of a disease. So for example, when I was doing research, I noticed that literally any manifestation of love, friendship, loyalty, altruism could be labeled as a form of addictive behavior. And in fact, altruistic behavior, which I you know, call me old fashioned, I think is not a bad thing, is actually diagnosed as compulsive helping. Right? <laughs> it's, it's called compulsive helping. And according to the definition, an interesting definition says of, of this disease, compulsive helpers disregard their own needs and feelings and focus on helping another person. I think that's, that, that kind of sums it up, you know, because in a different era, in a different society, this disease would be seen as an unbalanced, a really kind of positive thing. Now, of course, rhetorically, responsibility and loyalty are still upheld as public virtues, but in practice, practice these are time and time again on the mind. I just want to give you a little story that happened to me that really uh, kind of made me think about this in a, in a way that I hadn't done beforehand. Last year my mother died and in the course of dying in the hospital I used to go visit her all the time and the very first time I went to visit her I introduced myself, I said I'm Frank, Frank Ferretti, I'm Clara's son and the woman looks up at me and says, you mean her carer? No, her son. 
No, you, no, you are her carer. And I thought it was very interesting that she used the word carer, this kind of, uh, this kind of terminology, which completely denudes the idea that there's, a, that's some kind of spontaneous informal relationship by a bureaucratic typology that ha had to become. And in a sense, it, it's, it, it's kind of recalled to me just the way in which very elementary forms of, of compassion, of human interaction, have pretty much been kind of blocked, blocked out altogether. And it seems to me that for that reason, the public can never have the virtues that we want the public to have because we've done such a brilliant job at undermining those kinds of things. And in a sense, uh, as a result of that, what happens is that the public does become a kind of Gordon Brown nightmare, you know, the racist bigot, the person that doesn't really kind of understand me. That's really what the public is. When I was in Australia this summer in the middle of the election, Julia Gillard, who I don't particularly like, but you know, she, was, you know, she has got her strengths, uh, decided that she will set up a citizen's assembly to discuss climate change, which I thought was a good thing. You know, not, you know, why not? It affects the citizens. Everybody, you know, all the experts were saying, but, but these are citizens. They're not experts on climate change. The environmentalists were the worst. They said, we don't want citizens because ordinary folk are selfish. They care about guzzling gas. They're, they want to have big carbon footprints. So we want a proper committee of experts. And in the end, you know, when the coalition was set up, because they got a coalition in Australia as well, Gillard gave way to that, and she basically got rid of the idea of an assembly of ordinary people and brought in these experts, you know, with their deathly uh, dynamic, as you well know. And this is what the press release that, they, that she issued. She basically said, uh, instead of a, a committee of, 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 of people, what we have is, a, is a, a group of experts who have a greater understanding of the challenge of climate change. And she says, while the commission will set up a website, Ms. Gillard said there were no plans at this stage for a major advertising campaign. The committee concluded the proposal of a citizen's assembly should not be implemented and that there, are, there will be other ways of harnessing public dialogue engagement in the science of climate change and engagement in questioning questions of pricing carbon. And I just thought, you know, the, the language of public engagement, public dialogue, public inclusion, all the terms that are being used are very self-consciously used as a way of pushing people away. And I don't blame her, because I don't think actually it's her fault, nor do I blame any single politician, because I, I, I think that politicians are in a very difficult situation. It's not their mm -hmm. fault. But what I do blame is, is the fact that we don't recognize that there is a spiral of silence that's been imposed upon ordinary people, that we force people to censor themselves in terms of what they actually believe and what they think. And most importantly, instead of giving uh, cultural validation to their active, positive side, all the good things about human beings, and turning them into virtues, what we've done is we've kind of subjugated them to the most boring, flattened out form of bureaucratic rules. And I think as long as that's the case, any form of public engagement will simply be a caricature of itself. Quite a lot has been said. I want to give the panelists one moment to come back on each other before I go out to you. Um, Deborah, probably if we start with you, um, I'm quite interested in this critique that's come from the rest of the panel of empowerment and some of the engagement um, what do you think about that? Is that something you recognise? I, um, I, I can understand that people would be critical of, I mean, I think some of the ways that uh, organisations, politicians, government, other, other, other organisations in power try to engage with the public, all, all companies and brands come to that, it's often not done terribly well. Um, but I think that there are ways of doing it that are incredibly effective. Um, and there are mechanisms that can be used that can give people the information that they need to, um, you know, to, to become players. And I, th I th you know, things like citizens' juries and the like, I think, can work very well. I, I think what I was talking about actually was something slightly different from that. I was, I was talking about something that starts with, you know, the way we educate people with our, it, I mean, it, it is about the culture that we develop. It's much closer to where Frank was heading, I think. Um, I think that when, you know, my swing voters in Harlow were, were trying to evaluate the, the gulf between them and politicians, they recognised, that, you know, the, the cultural problem that's been identified, and they were they were struggling to find ways of addressing that. And I think where they ended up with was talking about, you know, teaching economics better in schools, um, teaching politics in schools, and you know, and, and actually 
building in mechanisms that, that, would, that would have people thinking about these things and talking about these things in an informed way much earlier on. Just one, one other thing I wanted to say in response to, um, actually again to Frank's point, when he talks about, um, you know, people doing volunteering so it's something to put on their CV rather than doing it because it's a great thing. I think he makes a really valid point and one that we would all recognize. But I think what we're talking about here is a much, much bigger shift in society and one that I've observed over you know, three decades, which is really a sort of shift from collective values to, to individual values. I mean, you know, when I was doing work for the Labour Party, um, back in the 80s, when, when Labour was sort of absolutely out in the cold. I mean, you know, this was one of the big shifts that Labour had to grapple with and understand. You know, the Conservatives were there with their, they had their, their symbolic policy of the sale of council house, which really summed up this sort of shift from collectivism to individualism and a way of politicians then offering it to people, unbelievably popular and still talked about today. And Labour was there saying, let's all get together, guys, and try and make this work. And nobody wanted to do it. Um, you know, I think that that, I, I, I think that has created problems for us on an ongoing uh, way as a society and, and as individuals, actually, because I don't, I think, you know, having stuff doesn't make us happy. Um, but this is big, you know, deep, um, deep problems to solve. I kind of share quite a lot of Frank's reservations, I'm, I'm, but I'm, like, as I said in my introductory remarks, I'm quite interested in the way political communities form, which are strong enough to actually act from the bottom up. Um, and what actually happened in Scotland during the Thatcher period was, eff in effect, a kind of ethical rebellion against the idea of Thatcherism. People just said, that is not for us. Now, I don't really know where the resource to do that came from, but the, the, this sidelining of certain virtues to do with solidarity and collectivism was too much for Scotland as a sort of collective. And the whole of the civil society and all of the political parties, except the Conservatives, rejected it in a very united way, in a kind of uh, civic bottom-up national assembly. N no, no one in, in, in the UK was very interested in that, but it is what happened. Um, and the strength of, of, of finding that rebellion then, then fed into a political movement which was strong enough in the end to lead to the setting up of the parliament. Now, I'm not saying that because I think Scotland is some kind of model community. It absolutely isn't. It was just a historical accident in that sense. And there are lots of problems around it and with it. Um, but nonetheless, it was a kind of lesson for me as a political observer and commentator in, in, in the very complex way in which people's sense of their cultural identity, their ethical values, and their sheer geographical position can interact to create a political community which actually empowers itself from the bottom up. Um, and, and I would never despair of the likelihood of that happening because even though our culture is very hostile um, to a lot of the best of collective values like mutual dedication or whatever, um, I think it, it can, you know, there is a tipping point beyond which people will say, this is not for us, too much of this, we are now going to act as a community to stop this. And you can see that at all kinds of levels. So I would never despair of those virtues re-emerging under pressure. OK, and I'll come to you, Graham. I think perhaps maybe you could talk a little bit more about um, reducing and minimising some of the barriers to collective action that both you and Frank mentioned. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Is that the big society? Well, there's a whole load of ways of allow making the political class more accountable. And my colleague Douglas Carswell is um, obsessed, and perhaps rightly, with the issue of safe seats, that regardless of party, if somebody thinks they can just sit there and get returned election after election without being subject to any scru particular scrutiny, either by their own party, let alone by the wider public, and they're going to get back regardless, that tends to uh, affect their behaviour, it tends to affect the amount of uh, cold November they, uh, days they want to spend um, talking to the electorate rather than talking to somebody else. Uh, so I think there's an, there is a structural issue there about trying to make, without necessarily um, overturning or changing the voting system, uh, fundamentally, can we make uh, the politicians feel more answerable to us, better able to pick out people where we're unhappy, where that sense of uh, anger that Scotland had on a, a wide sense can be used against particular individuals. I think Joyce is quite right about the issue of injustice. I mean, why would you go into politics? I went to, I think I was uh, unhealthily young when I wanted to go into politics, and it was probably because of a sense of injustice, unfairness, the need to put things right. And a sense of injustice does drive and galvanise people in political action. Uh, and it's I would say it's an advantage for the left um, uh, because 
I don't know, I mean, the, the, the Labour Party and the left generally f seems to find it very easy to demonise and characterise their opponents as being morally um, uh, bad people. They find it easy to suggest that, uh, to, that uh, they're interested in very narrow interests rather than they have broad interests. And I think the coming years, we'll see a, a, a gal, you know, we'll see a lot of people getting involved in politics from the left, but as they're told that Cameron and his top friends are uh, absolutely indifferent to the needs of ordinary, normal people and are in fact driven by some, uh, if you, on reflection, you, you'd see it find a rather bizarre idea of benefiting, strengthening the rich, strengthening the powerful at the expense of the weak. But uh, there's, always, there's always a market for that and people like already have a very low opinion of politicians. So I, I think the coalition government, which I think, uh, as in most governments, is full of people trying to do their best and do it um, for the general good, will find themselves up against an increasingly focused and angry um, uh, opposition uh, because of those points being put over. Do you see it as a question of really asking the political class just to back off in terms of their public engagement projects and trying to get people involved um, and the removal of that kind of stigmatization of behavior? Is that really, is that what we're kind of, call is that what you're calling for? Well, in, in part, I think there is a, a, a big mistake that that is being made, and, and, and both the left and the right are complicit in it for different ways. And historically, what, what the left, what New Labour, for example, has done, is it uh, adopted this imperative of, of formalizing informal life as much as possible. And it's kind of, it, it lo you know, I mean, I think Short Start is a very good example of that. Just, just the, the elementary suspicion towards parents is palpable. If you talk to Short Start workers, you know, after a pint of beer, when their guards are down, they really think that most parents are scum. And, and they really think that, you know, they've got all these incredible insights about how to bring children up that is manifestly lacking by these kind of white trash people that are there and everything else. So what they've done, it, what New Labour has done is, is brought in all these, you know, mentors and facilitators and, you know, supporters and everything else. And, but more importantly, it kind of uh, uh, it juridified the whole of society, juridification has just expanded. So even when we haven't got you know, formal laws, there are laws. So when my son tried to get a paper route uh, at the age of 13, because he wanted to make a bit of money, he was told he's going to have to wait another year because you know, uh, 14 is the minimum age. You know, I don't know where that comes from, but that was the law in Faversham in Kent. You know, sort of, and, and, and I can give you many, many examples of the way that judification works. So that's, that's the mistake from the left. From the right, I think the, the problem is, is more not understanding the appropriate role of the private sector. And I, and I think that one of the points that Machiavelli made, and I think, it's, I think Cameron has got to really learn the lessons, is that humanists in, in, in Italy, what they were worried about more than anything else were, were mercenaries. Because they knew that whenever the mercenaries were in charge, right, they had no real commitment to what they were doing. And, and they could you know, kind of leave the middle of the battlefield if somebody offered them more money. And we've already seen this on the new labor. I mean, the, that there, were, there, are, there are more consultants than rats in many state <laughs> areas, right? I mean, they're there all the time, right? And what kind of loyalty and what kind of commitment do they have to the, to the work that they are doing? Do you remember the time when in Northern Ireland, those two soldiers got shot? I don't know if I remember, a year and a half or two years ago. And then you discover that actually the barracks were being, being guarded by a private security firm, <laughs> right? Now, yeah. you know, we have private security firms running prisons exactly. and, and various other sectors. Now, I, you know, call me old-fashioned, I think that unless you've got commitment to something bigger than, than the bottom line, the quality of the work that, that you're doing is not going to be brilliant. And therefore, I think that, you know, private sector, yes, in these areas, but there's got to be a public sector element. People, people who do the best things in the public sector are the ones who do it because they believe in what they're doing. And they've made the trade-off. They're not going to get a big salary there, but they, they love what they're doing. They're committed to that. That's really the kind of ethos that you want to develop. And I think between the bureaucratization of the left uh, and the private element being brought in in, in, in areas that are quite inappropriate uh, have this kind of deathly consequence of, of making it very difficult for the public to be public. Everybody on the panel has assumed that public engagement is a good thing, even Frank with his broader uh, historical perspective. And in discussing public engagement, there are essentially two ideas that are current. Either there's a sort of culpable level of apathy uh, in the public, or there are barriers, either cultural or institutional barriers. 
holding back this inherent desire of people to get involved with politics and with society. What if actually people have taken a choice and decided act they don't want to do this? We have more opportunities to do all sorts of things in our lives these days and perhaps engagement with political and public life has just slid down people's levels of priority. And that's a good thing because people have got more choice, people are enjoying their lives for themselves and they don't have to muck around in the public sphere trying to make things better. Point two, if the public decides to get engaged, you might not like it. The uh, substance underlying the public square, um, the actual actuality of it, is economics. Uh, and specifically the kind of uh, uh, economic development um, in which um, the whole world is united, or at least related, um, in the relations of capitalist production. That was the historical precondition uh, for the, the public square or sphere, uh, depending um, which um, uh, diagram you want you prefer. Um, and conversely, it strikes me that one of the reasons, one of the factors why in the West, perhaps particularly, uh, there is something of an emptying out um, of, uh, uh, of the, the public square is to do with the increasing distance of, of the way we live now, locally, regionally. It's increasing uh, estrangement uh, from the universal relations of production as the basis for self-interest uh, having to be measured against the interests of society as a whole. Uh, again, the, the substance of, of the debate uh, historically in, in the public square. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that that's the only factor uh, involved in recent developments. But what I am suggesting is that without considering it as a factor, our considerations are going to have to be rather more limited than they ought to be. You see, it can't be answerable, understandable, addressable at the level of the interpersonal, because who could be more personable than, than Graham and working the, the, uh, the, the high street in, in his constituency like it's like his own personal green room? You, know, it, it, you can't imagine anybody more personable at doing that. And if, on the other hand, you go to somewhere in the, uh, the layer that I think Joyce and uh, Frank are operating in when they talk about the community or the culture. I, I think the problem is that if you're not careful, that ends up as an aggregate of the interpersonal, unless you enter into the discussion this other element of the objective factor as well as the subjective. To do with sort of ideas of what's variously been, policies of what are variously being called public participation, user involvement, community, engagement and so on. Um, there's a large body of social science research now which demonstrates an implementation gap there on poli those policies which have been going on for nearly 30 years now. Um, and I was just wondering um, if people might comment on whether this notion of the big society um, is in a way a sort of a response to a kind of gap that's been left there, um, whereas what we might see as a preferable situation is um, politicians, policy makers kind of listening to what the public or communities or service users, patients or whatever are saying and responding with the, you know, in terms of the shape of public services rather than it then being a case of people having to provide the service or being expected to provide the services for themselves as the solution. Um, you've meant, uh, you keep mentioning education and um, kind of like trying to involve the public by kind of teaching them. It's almost like you're treating the public like fools. Um, uh, you said, uh, Deborah, you mentioned about trying to teach economics and politics in school. Uh, being a school uh, student myself, I know that the majority of people, they try to teach that in citizenship. Um, majority of people actually just find it patronizing and annoying and actually, if anything, it's more of a turn off than a turn on. It's, it's actually this kind of, of we must teach them. It's just annoying and educate, just arguing, oh, we need to educate them. Well, there's a thing called the internet, and you can go and look on the internet if, you f if you're interested or read books. It's, it's not a case of kind of looking down on these people. I think you need to respect them. 
one thing that, that Graham brought up was this idea that the left have got the advantage of injustice. They can throw it at them. But that's exactly <laughs> everything that the Tories and the Liberals in the coalition have prevised everything on. It's fairness. We're tackling social injustice. Everyone does it. And it, it brings to mind the idea that, you know, the idea of social injustice as your motivation or your uh, standpoint is a kind of way in which legitimises you doing anything. And so, you know, you take anything like, you know, go back to education, you take education, everything's done in the n name of tackling social injustice. But that, what that means is you disenfranchise ordinary teachers, you don't trust them to do it, you embody bureaucratic mechanisms to enforce some kind of mechanism to create inclusion projects or whatever, and actually crush the, the idea that ordinary teachers could do something about looking after the kids they teach without a, a bureaucracy. You mentioned Ofsted. Why didn't you scrap it if it was that bad? The big society um, uh, issue that came up with people providing for themselves, I suppose it, one of the reasons for the big society is to recognise the limitations of what the state can do. We, we have had um, a tremendous amount of money spent. It turned out quite a lot of it unaffordable um, by the previous government. And we still didn't narrow the gap between rich and poor in educational outcomes. We had health inequalities, if anything, probably widen over the period. When I went out ten days ago with a neighbourhood team um, of health workers in my area, they were saying that really having to work hard to get... Um, a generation of people, that's how they described it to me, um, who are sitting there passively waiting for the nurse and the other workers to look after them. And that's saying the only way that, that it'll, you'll have both better health outcomes and the only way, given the demographics of an ageing population, that we'll be able to afford it, that we're going to be able to have dignity and decent health care in the home, is for people to take greater responsibility for their own um, uh, looking after themselves. And I think by implication that their families also do so for them as well. Um, so I, I, it's, it, it can be seen by the cynic as a, a, an excuse for just cutting public services, but the public finances are as they are. And if we are going to deal with an aging population, more vulnerable people living into adulthood, thanks to advances in medicine as well, then we are going to have to reflect on our role, not just as taxpayers who then sit back and say anyone who doesn't want to spend the money is being selfish. It could perhaps be us who are a little selfish in finding it rather irksome that we might be expected to make more of a contribution to the society around us than we've been used to doing. It, it, it doesn't really matter whether you like the term big society or not, but we do need to think about the kind of world that we're, we're living in. And we do have to think about the fact that, uh, as Graham was indicating, that uh, after decades and decades of uh, you know, sort of state intervention, uh, there seems to be no palpable you know, sort of improvement in education, in fact, as a as a father and as a sociologist, I can, I can tell you that the educational levels of English children compared to, you know, where I come from in East Europe are appallingly low. You know, in Hungary, where I come from, children, 40 kids in a class, conspire to do far better than, you know, small classes here in England do. And, you know, why is that? It's not because of better teachers' training, because there is no teachers' training, which is a good thing on balance. Uh, but, it's, but, 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 it, but it's because of the high expectation that that teacher transmits to the class. It's a simple question of transmitting high expectations. Can I just say one thing? If, if the government is really interested in going forward on this, then I think the way forward would be for it to take the third sector a little bit more seriously. See, if you take education, I think it's a mistake to get private sector into education. I think that doesn't work. You know, sort of, I mean, all the good independent schools that you have in this country, they didn't begin as private companies. They began because there were groups of people that got together, believed in what they were doing, and they set up a charity over the years, and, and then you have a wonderful education system. And similarly today, what we need are not the, you know, private companies to come in, because I can tell you they're pretty useless, if we go by the American example. <laughs> they really are not going to be God's gift to you know, English children. But what we do need are committed people who want to set up, you know, who want to experiment, who want to try different ways of teaching children, and that'd be a a really nice thing, and that's what your subcommittee should really be pushing for as much as possible, to get that kind of direction, which is quite consistent with you know, any idea of big society. It's not a contradiction. It's quite consistent with that. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to go back to the, the, the uh, student's point, which I think is, um, was, was interesting. What, when I talked about people saying they wanted 
to, uh, they, they felt they needed more in education, education was a barrier to getting involved. This was a bottom-up comment. This was not a top-down comment. This wasn't my observation. I was reporting back their observation to me. So I, you know, I had gone out and said to people, what, what would encourage you to get more involved in things? And that was their assessment of what the, of what the barrier was. What I would say about your point about patronizing, and so I, it simply says to me that the way that economics, politics, whatever, are being taught in your school, uh, it's, you know, it's not being very well taught would, would be my, um, I mean, I don't know if that's, that's true or not, but I think that must be the case. Um, actually, I really wanted to go back to the, the, the chap in front's point, though, which I like both of his points. Um, you know, do people actually want to get involved at all? Uh, probably not a lot, actually. So there has to be a view, which, which I hold, but it is debatable about whether or not people getting involved makes better decisions. Certainly, I'd agree with the second point, that when the public does get involved, they don't necessarily give politicians, people in power, um, the, the views that they would like to hear. I kind of think that's the point, actually. Yeah, I'm going to cheat and make two very short points. The first one is a point about um, actual parliamentarians. Um, the kind of work that Graham's been, been talking about is, is it, it occupies in the kind of theory of civil society quite an interesting middle place. Um, uh, parliamentarians who become ministers go through a visible process of being kind of dehumanised and groomed so that they look all right on the telly and they've got to be 40, they've got to be male, they've got to have 2.2 kids and all the rest of it, you know. Um, um, but parliamentarians are in a very different position and I think it's a, it's a field that deserves a lot of study. I'm very interested in it through my work with the Hansard Society and um, how the ordinary backbench parliamentarians actually can act as a real conduit um, for the voices of the people but tends to kind of lose, lose, lose that, that characteristic as soon as they move further into the executive um, into that power. Um, but I'm also interested in this point um, here um, down at the front about um, what's wrong with people just not being involved in politics. Well the thing is, I, I think I said in my opening remarks that when people's lives are going well they do tend to be less involved in politics and that is, that's fair enough, that's absolutely fine. But what you need is, uh, is, is to have a kind of resource as a community so that at the moment when something really does go wrong, you're not such a bunch of atomized individuals that you cannot act. And that's the trouble. What you need is a society which has enough kind of wisdom and, and, and collective strength within itself to maintain certain collective institutions even during periods of relatively kind of atomized prosperity when everybody's just getting on with their own lives. And I think it's, it's a very stupid human being who thinks that they are nothing but an individual that they owe nothing to society. You know, there was a period back there in the 90s when people are driving along on roads built by the state to schools provided by the state and saying, oh, well, politics and the state have nothing to do with me. That's not a healthy individualistic development. That's just dim-witted. Um, I think politicians are kidding themselves if they think people aren't engaged in political issues. I think they are, and I teach in a school, and if I ever go off tangent from history and talk to my kids about something political, um, they, I'm a inspired and terrified by some of the opinions. Um, I, I think they're not interested in politics. I think it's links to what Joy, uh, Joyce says about disempowerment. I think um, that political parties are an institution that are dead to a lot of people. People really are interested in political issues and they're interested, interested even more so what with the recession. But why would they want to be interested in what is essentially a weird bunch of people who went through Eton and are now all scratching each other's backs? I don't, why would you be interested in that? It's a big society in a sense, but how do you give people a progressive feeling that at whatever level they are operating, they can be effective, they can do something? It seems to me that one of the faults of the big society is that it's cutting out a level. It's, it's making it far more individual, far more privatized, far more small groups acting, but leaving out the level, for example, of local authority involvement over a wide area. And I speak coming from a city of 300,000 with a very diverse society where it's important at that level. The other aspect is, if we're going to teach economics and so on, that's rather dead, but why not teach how we've got where we are? There was a wonderful exhibition at the British Library, Taking Liberties, about the whole way in which we've had to fight to get up where we are. Now that sort of approach, how we have to fight continually to even keep what we've got as well as extend it. Both sides, I think, are required. A hierarchy of levels at which you are effective and also a perception 
of that it's got to be done over a long period and has been done. Frank, I, I appreciate your remarks about how uh, empowerment is kind of enfeebling, and, and obviously it's the public that's supposed to empower the politicians and not the other way around. But, you know, I think we also have to recognize the extent to which the public allows itself to be manipulated. I mean, there's been something like $4 billion, $4 billion spent in the uh, uh, U.S. midterm campaigns, that the election's happening next week. And a lot of that goes to advertising, a lot of that goes to negative advertising, which people claim not to like, but which everybody knows works really well. One of the reasons that the public is manipulated is that there really is a, a fair amount of, on a national level, of civic ignorance. Something like two-thirds of the public can't tell you what the three branches of government are. Now, you can say it's condescending to try to teach that. Go look it up on the internet. But if you believe everything you read on the internet, I've got some bridges to sell you. The other, the other reason that I, I think that it's, and I, and I think this is really not anybody's fault, that people can be manipulated is that for the most part, it's only natural that people are going to tend to engage more at a local level. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, that's, that's, I'm not saying that's a bad thing in many ways, it's a good thing, but if we engage at a local level, we're still asked to act nationally, politically. And the issues nationally, politically are extraordinarily complicated. Uh, hard for any of us to really grasp. The, the other problem um, is, well, it's maybe a problem, maybe not, but I, I wonder if any of you have looked at Mal Malcolm Gladwell's recent article in The New Yorker about the relative inefficacy of virtual engagement. It's, it's really quite interesting. You know, he talks about, in a way, the, the problem of engagement being shifted to the virtual world and how that's a lower risk and lower commitment arena. And he it compares, for example, the kind of risk taking and commitment that was uh, demonstrated by the, the civil rights activists in mid 20th century America and the kind of risk and commitment that you find in virtual communities. And I wonder if any of you would like to comment on that. In terms of public engagement, I was a bit surprised that no members of the panel, panel actually mention the sort of exponential increase of comment blogging on the internet. I mean, Deborah talked about having um, groups coming together as focus groups. Graham talked about going off in the rain to the market. But in fact, what's happened over the last 10 years is absolutely incredible increase in opportunity for everyone to comment. So there's not a single television program, radio program, without them saying, please comment. Now, when you go on, these pre on the, uh, the website and have a look, you find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments. And what I suspect the sort of twin problems of this <clears throat> are is one, that there is so much of it. So when, where we talk about information overload, the authorities, the politicians also suffer from overload. And so I very much suspect that this is, a, in a way, rather like sending the kids out into a room to have a scrap and have a chat, <laughs> while the adults go off and do something more sensible, like have tea. And, uh, and, it, and this is a major problem. So people think they're giving comments, but what's probably happening is you've just got a researcher somewhere, reads that 59 say this, 25 say that. Thanks, that's the end of it. That's the one problem. And the other one, I think, is because of the ease of commenting, is actually militating against reasoned argument because this becomes a sort of visceral response. In a second, everyone can say, I'm important, I've got credibility, I'm going to put my thoughts down. And when you go through these thoughts, an amazing number are just facile, but they're given credibility. They're given credibility by the TV programs. You had Eddie Mayer on, on PM reading out the most incredible nonsense and just saying, we've been sent this. And this is really worrying that uh, rational thinking is actually being destroyed by this and people are being made to think that this is worthwhile. I mean, the last point, you can't even write a letter to your MP, which formerly was reasoned, and you had pages and pages of reasoned stuff, because the poor chap's not going to read it, because he's got so many blogs, so many comments, that it's not worthwhile doing this. So that's, this is really quite a dangerous thing. On the one hand, it seems wonderful. It's democratizing opinion. On the other hand, it could be destroying rational thinking. I find a lot of discussions at the moment, um, whether it's about public and private or collective or an individual, quite confusing, and I'm interested what the panel 
think about this, seems to be that a lot of people responding to the current culture, recognizing there's something wrong, they say, well, we must have more public and less private. We must have more collective and less individualism. Um, and yet, I work in a sector where I really recognize what Frank was saying, which is that collectively, we are collectively allowing um, in teaching the sort of destruction of the whole idea of passion in relation to teaching by, you know, on numerous occasions I sit in rooms where we all individually know that we don't agree with the imposition of health and safety regulations or the changing of our relationship with student or the reorganizing our teaching in order to comply with the National Student Survey. There are lots of different things going on where collectively we sit in meetings and agree to things which individually we know are wrong. And in that context, I kind of think what we actually need is more individualism, not more collectivity. And that, I'd be interested to see what the panel think about that, more people standing up against the contemporary culture. We've almost been saying that the interface between the public is the interface between the public and politicians, which is putting a very heavy load on Graham's shoulders. But if you look at the number of institutions, health authorities, schools, um, a number of quangos, if you take the museum's point, for example, the museum's got off relatively lightly in the comprehensive spending review with only a 15% reduction. Uh, massive visitor figures, free entry, entirely, uh, not entirely, to a very large extent funded by public money. To what extent are they accountable to the public? And in which case, to which public? To the visitors who actually come, to the visitors whom they should be encouraging, but who aren't coming, but who should come. And I think there's a much wider issue of public engagement in terms of devolution, which can be done very effectively by a whole number of institutions, including those quangos who do survive, without saying everything has to be an engagement with your poor MP. Otherwise, he'll be standing on the street corner all day. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a point about the public engagement. Uh, the, it, there's a range of public engagement, and obviously on the extreme of it uh, is the example of Soviet Union, uh, in which 100% of the population or 99% of the population were extremely politically aware of what's happening, and they knew the answers to the questions, not only about what are the ranges of powers exist in Soviet Union, who are the what are the names of the people who are on the top of the power, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but they also were extremely aware of what's happening in other countries. And if you wanted to go abroad, you had to pass an interview where you had to answer questions about the political system of the country you're going to, which is obviously an extreme example. And once we decide where we want to have political engagement level in UK, for example, yeah, in this range, then we can learn from this example to see how we can motivate people to be engaged in the political um, activity. So I think in Soviet Union, one of the ways was to breathe the culture of um, people uh, uni uniting, you know, since, uh, you know, from school, um, sc uh, from school, school year, uh, years uniting into unions where they took decisions uh, over how the uh, social life is going to be managed. So it was micromanagement. It, and I think that my personal idea uh, is that precisely at that level, political engagement, as we say, or social engagement, is something which is worth to have. So we don't want, it's coming back to your question, we don't want public to be engaged in, you know, maybe higher levels, but this micromanagement is where it's be helpful. So I'd like to hear the panel's view on uh, where you see uh, public engagement in terms of the range positioning and uh, which level you, can, you think that public engagement can benefit social development. Thank you. Uh, I liked Frank's comment that there's uh, more consultants than rats. That's certainly been my experience. Uh, I've been to a few public consultations and uh, you're faced with a barrage of people that, uh, that are operating within the framework that you've got to operate in within as well. And if you step outside of them boundaries, you might get a patronising nod and, uh, and that's about it. Um, it often seems like when you read the blurb of these outfits that they're all out for self-justification. Uh, what they're wanting to maintain the framework uh, and so like convince the public that that is the way they want to go rather than follow their own aspirations. 
Well, rather than suffering from information overload, as was suggested at the front, and us living in such a complex world where there are so many variables that government can't possibly do anything today, I think the real problem is absence of singular purpose. Um, I find it remarkable that we still have an administration that believes that it wants to protect us from everything, whether that be international terrorists, H1N1 influenza, child molesters, poison food, alcohol, vagrants, hoodies, you name it rather than seek to achieve one thing. I always find it easier to achieve something than to prevent everything. So I was wondering whether George could tell us what his administration will achieve. Interested in the aside about history and your students get excited when they're discussing anything but history and that's part of the problem. Just a democracy of opinion where you don't actually concentrate on the history is a really bad thing. I think that's probably part of the, the discussion and I always think about um, the, the difference between knowledge and opinion. You can have everybody giving you opinions to select committees or whatever, you know, and they're not worth anything. And I think one thing you should do if you're running an education select committee or trying to decide anything about education is find out something about education. And one of the most philistine things you do find is the idea that, you know, because you just give it over to teachers, the sort of thing you express. But what would they do? They'd run schools based on emotional intelligence or playing at therapy or happiness lessons right? because they don't, haven't got the knowledge anymore. And one thing you should do and think about if you want to really engage public is start with the teachers, but make sure they get teacher education and not teacher training. That they know Plato, uh, Rousseau, Dewey, and a lot about the psychology and history of education, and then you'll make a real start, but just letting them play will, will produce therapy in schools rather than anything really educational. Sometimes what looks like uh, engagement may not actually be that, so when Joyce made the point that, uh, that this is not for us, it was an ethical rebellion, actually what it seemed to be was a retreat from politics. And um, when, when, yes, we do have choices, but the Tea Party is not an engaged public, and neither, as it happens, was the Obama phenomenon. In fact, it was just using the public as a stage army. And it seems to me that, um, in, in, in terms of having choices, the reason why people are making choices not to be involved is because generally we think people make things worse, not better. And we're very cynical about things. And perhaps there's not a new idea that we need to find, but go back to some of the old-fashioned old ones about the ideas of commitment to one another, about responsibility and virtue. Those enlightened ideas, they're very simple, but go and pioneer some of them a little bit more and argue them out ourselves. I want to go back to what this debate was about, which was about the individuated society and its relationship to something called the public, which is a spectre. We are the public in this room. What is the public? It's a fragmented series of things which only come together when, as Joyce said, there is some sense of injustice. I first made um, my comment when I was 34, I'm 65, in a public space, uh, so-called, when I was in a, um, a branch meeting of a political party and I remember being so frightened that I was going to stand up as I am doing now as if I were in school, and I was so uncertain of my ill-formed thought, but I was driven by the need to contest something that I knew was being said that was unfair. And from then on, I wonder now, where are the spaces outside of school for people to rehearse their capacity to go from being an individual with experiences that are honed by political debate and by the chance to be challenged in a safe space to becoming politically active and the political mode, the polity, is not about politicians. The polity is about the space that we take because we are able and have been allowed to develop something of value that can be expressed politically and can galvanize some sort of movement. And I don't believe anymore that it's about political parties. I think things will ebb and flow, geezers of activity will erupt and things will happen and then they will, and somebody else will take over and do something else somewhere else. I think there's only one thing that is worse than a, a public not interested in politics and that is a political establishment adapting to that sentiment. A um, very nice example for that is in Germany, in the German city Stuttgart, thousands of people for the last week for the last weeks have been demonstrating against the modernization of a central railway station. It's no surprise you would say that the Green Party would support these kind of protests, as modernization is, is a bad thing anyway. But what is interesting is that even the Social Democratic Party, having supported that project for the last 10 years, um, is now saying, well, we are still in favor of the project, but nevertheless, we would like to have a referendum around, about that, uh, although everything has been decided years ago. So what we're having here is a political class 
bowing in front of a fed up uh, public and in doing so basically sacrificing democratic institutional ways of organizing society. I think a really good way of uh, achieving something for this administration would be to counter the so-called uh, dis disempowerment and disengagement that we've all been discussing by maybe actually listening to the 80% of people who don't want to be in Afghanistan, the 80% of people who don't want Trident, and almost everyone that would like a healthcare system that works, education that works, and most importantly, t no tuition fees. Thank you very much. Thank well, there's so many things I'd like to comment on, but actually I didn't want to lose sight of the, uh, the, the, the first speaker in this round who made the point about why the kids he teaches, you know, why would they want to be interested in what some bloke who wasn't at all representative of them had to say. And I do think this whole, the problem of politicians not being representative enough of the people they purport to represent is both a symptom and a cause of, of a lot of the malaise that we've been discussing. And I don't think this is just about age or gender or social class or, or race. I think it's, it's much more about the worrying evolution we have of a kind of political class, people who have gone straight from university into politics and not picked up very much real life experience on the way. I think that's a real problem. The, and then linked to that, in the end, I, I mean, I, I love the idea of, of all politicians being accountable for one thing because in the end, most politicians will be remembered, if they're lucky, for one thing. Uh, you know, Mrs. Thatcher is remembered for council house sales. Uh, Tony Blair, like it or not, will be remembered, I think, for the Iraq war. Um, and I think, you know, in the end, most politicians, um, you know, do two things. They overpromise and then they underdeliver. And if they could just get that right, it might be a start. <laughs> I want actually to come back to the lady down the front here who said, don't we need more individualism? Um, I absolutely, oddly, completely agree. I miss collectivism and solidarity, but I agree that we need more individualism. But my, my, my life experience tells me that in order to be the kind of strong individual who can stand up to the kind of bureaucratic bollocks that you've just described, actually you cannot do that unless you come from a strong society with, with a lots of informal, as I said at the beginning, as well as formal ways of passing on values and understanding standings about what it is to live well in a society with other people. I think we have lost a lot of that and I think we have to fight the forces in our society, most of them just straightforward economic forces to do with wanting everyone to sit in front of a flat screen telly instead of talking to each other. We have to fight the forces that diminish the quality of our interpersonal relations in that way and the interpersonal relations moving into social relations. There's a paradox in the business of individualism and freedom which someone else uh, brought up, I think the lady who was talking about the experience of Russia. Um, I'm very much aware that a lot of people who came from intensely collectivised societies like that treasure the right to have nothing to do with politics or the government and just have a completely private life, and that is completely understandable. But the truth of a free society is that the price of freedom is a little bit of engagement, I think. And I think you cannot expect to continue to be free if you allow your society to become so atomised that it can't act. Finally, three words of advice to political parties about what to do rather than doing sort of artificial... Um, um, programs of engagement. If they want people to re-engage with them, this is what they've got to do. They've got to express real differences in society. Two neoliberal parties contesting an election is not an election worth having under the conditions that we live in. And that's what we had right up until this one and may well have again. Um, secondly, they have to clean up government and get it disentangled, be clear about what is government and what is not government. As Frank says, you know, this business of having, you know, security companies running army bases, ridiculous. Government should define its role and set about doing it well. They've got to confront power on behalf of ordinary people. That goes back to what the last speaker just down there said. They've got to accept that ordinary people are pretty disgusted with a lot of the things that have been done in their name and change their policies accordingly. And if they do those three things, people will become more engaged. Um, thank you. We, ha we had the point about um, the young people being interested in the issues, not politics, and um, I, I think you're a teacher. Uh, if people don't understand how they engage with the process of decisions being made, they are being let down, I would say, by their teacher. So you've got to, um, whether, whether parties are going to go or not, um, uh, but you have to work out, you have to look at the mechanics of how you make things change. Otherwise, you're just mouthing off, you're leading people to, to in, engage themselves in things which don't result in things. I spend my time when I meet with people trying to look at, the, let's not have a meeting in which we mutually enrich our knowledge of this subject. Let us try and work out how we can change things for the better. Let's look at what the levers we need to pull. 
if we agree, have common ground on changes we need to make, and let's pull them and make it happen. Um, Bismarck said laws are like sausages. You don't want to see how they're being made because it's an ugly and mechanical process. But you have to focus on that, and teachers have to help give people the idea they've got to engage with it if they want to change it. Maybe they can get rid of parties, but they're still going to have to find a me mechanisms by which to change the society around them. Um, I don't agree with the idea that um, rational thinking is being destroyed by facile blogging. I think quite the opposite. I, sp I, I look at um, blogs quite regularly, and uh, there's a huge amount of facile nonsense, and there's people you learn to look out for. But I'm struck by how often, actually, people throw in different facts, different points of view, and there is a sort of dialectic by, the end, where, by which I think all the people reading that blog have a better understanding of the arguments and are actually better able to, they're more likely to have a, a, a distilled point of view, a common point of view, if the, if the logic takes them there, and are better able to tell people like me, actually you're wrong, and tell us precisely why. And I think, so I, I'm, I'm quite positive about, about that. Um, uh, the absence of singular purpose. Um, I'm going to try and cheat um, because I think the administra this administration uh, will probably be remembered for two things. One is it's the deficit, it's just uh, uh, something it has to do, um, it won't be popular and I hope we can get through and do it in the fairest uh, um, and most effective manner possible. The, 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 the other one is tackling the poverty trap. I think the biggest failure of the last Conservative government was that we talked about, I believe in the 1970s, about tackling the poverty trap and when we left power, people were as trapped as ever. Gordon Brown made an effort with tax credits to try and lift people up, but still had enormous amounts of traps. We need to make work pay. We need to ensure the maximum number of people can have the dignity of work in a way that means that they are more secure and they're better able to look after their family. If we can do that, this will be an administration worth remembering. In reaction to what uh, Wendy Kaminer said, which I, I agree a lot of her sentiment, and uh, it is important not to idealize the public, because there's a danger of kind of creating this kind of fantasy public that somehow is, is, is intrinsically virtuous just because it's the public. And I think that uh, that's not the way these things work. And in fact, one of the points that Machiavelli also made was that public virtue and public spirit is, is a very difficult phenomenon to cultivate. And it's even more difficult to nurture because it's not something that can simply reproduce itself indefinitely. It needs to be continually nurtured somehow. And, and the way you nurture it actually is something that we haven't discussed, but it is really the real secret is leadership. See, I'd, I'm probably the only person here, I don't believe in public engagement. I think that's an irrational term. I do believe in, 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 in leadership, which I think is, is, is really important, and that's really what you need if you're going to have a, a, a right kind of public. And that leads me to a point I want to make. I want to make this point, even though it's going to be totally unpopular, and everyone's going to hate me for it afterwards, <laughs> which is this. I actually disagree with one point that Deborah made right at the very beginning, when she said that one of the problems that we have in this country is that our leaders don't represent us. Right. And that argument has been used by politicians all the time. So New Labour went to the most grotesque extent where essentially cleaning ladies were given you know, OBEs and you know, they were made ladies and sirs. And anybody with the most undistinguished track record was all of a sudden given all this affirmation just because they were undistinguished. Uh, and you had you know, this kind of uh, caricature attempt to kind of replicate the public. And it's become quite normal to criticize people for going to Eton, you know, sort of as if somehow that's like being a Dracula figure, instead of saying, these are really lucky guys, I wish I had gone to a school like that and got that level of training and education. So you kind of get the sense that somehow you got this kind of privileged bunch of them, and, and you forget one very simple thing, which is that throughout human history, real leaders were never like the rest of society, which is why they were leaders. I don't know about you, but you know, if I'm on a if I want a ship that's sinking, I don't want to be led by a person that's you know, crapping their pants just like I am, right? <laughs> I, want, I want somebody who's very different than me to kind of get me out of, out of those circumstances. And if you look at every single leader, real well, leader... Like old Etonians they, and cleaning ladies, are they, well, that's your point. Well, I think on balance, yes, they, they, on balance. But if you look at them, they were all very different to the people they represented. And that's partially why they were leaders. And instead of adopting this populist kind of sense of demagogy, oh, you, you know, there aren't enough black people here, there aren't enough women here, or there aren't enough disabled people here. I think we should say, who, you know, what kind of leadership are they, are they giving us? And I think we should criticize people it's over so there for, 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 for their lack of leadership and, and their lack of their ability to give that kind of leadership. And one final point, on, I agree with, with Joyce on this individual collectivity. The two are intimately linked. You can't have strong individuals unless you have solidarity. And without in, strong individuals, Solidarity will be exhausted very quickly and will have no real meaning. I think we've got to get that balance right very quickly in our society. Yeah, I love the way you finish by 
making Deborah and Joyce disagree with you in your last <laughs> remarks. <laughs> That's a sign of a good discussion because it opens it up rather than closes it down. Please join me in thanking the panel for their contribution. Thank